Hello, Chem2. Um, today we're going to talk about the next section associated with Chapter 8, the Thermochemistry Chapter. And this is the actually the core of this chapter. It's all about what is called calorimetry. Um, some interesting computations and calculations are associated with how we determine how much energy is stored by stored or released by different chemical reactions. So administrative pieces, first off, you guys have the chapter five exam you need to get done um, before the end of this week. Um, on the owl, you have multiple shots at it, so please take care of that. And then there's the optional owl and the required owl. Okay, let's go. So we've already talked about heat flow and specific heat and what um, M is and delta T. And we are now going to focus a lot more on the second bullet item, which is calculating the Q. Um, the heat of release from what are it's called calorimetric data, where you're talking about seeing what happens to a system and temperature changes to the system and how it can uh, give you some information about what happened during the reaction. So, we've already done the first one. Second section is se section two, measurements of heat flow or calorimetry, a, a magic word that's associated with this section. So, what is a calorimeter? A calorimeter is a device of sorts, and there's two of them that we'll be focusing on in this particular um, section um, that allows you to measure the heat flow of a reaction. Now, the big picture is what you're going to do is have a reaction take place, and you're going to have some other, I don't want to use the word system, but some other contraption device that is going to absorb that energy and then um, that thing that's going to absorb the energy is going to change in temperature. It's going to either increase in temperature or decrease in temperature based on what happens to the reaction. And then um, what the system is set up to do is ha to have a limited amount of energy lost during the reaction. So normally the contraption has some type of, type of insulation on it that allows for um, all of the energy that's lost during the reaction or all the energy that is absorbed by the reaction is transferred directly to the calorimeter. So what we're going to be looking at is a, a measurement of heat flow, and we're going to be looking at what happens to the amount of energy in the surroundings and the opposite, the, so the, whatever the calorimeter absorbs or whatever the calorimeter loses, the exact opposite, the same quantity of heat is going to be lost or gained, but it's going to be in the opposite direction. So. We're going to be looking a lot at uh, situations where we're going to be wondering what the calculation is, what the amount of heat of the reaction is, the Q of the loss of the clue, Q lost or Q gained of the reaction, but it's going to be the exact same quantity, but the opposite direction as the calorimeter. And you see here that we have this calculation that very looks very similar to what we did yesterday of C delta T, sometimes referred to simply as cat because that delta looks kind of like a in A. So C delta T, the C of the calorimeter, and that's going to be the heat capacity, like we talked about yesterday, capital C heat capacity of the calorimeter times the change in temperature is going to give you the chimp, the heat gained or lost by the calorimeter. Let's look at some examples. So suppose you're going to look at a reaction that is exothermic. If a reaction is exothermic, that means that it is going to, the reaction is going to release heat. Well, if that's going to be the case, then the calorimeter is going to gain that heat. So if the reaction loses heat, then the calorimeter is going to gain that heat, meaning that the Q of the reaction is going to be negative, but the calorimeter is going to be positive. But again, I have to say this one more time, the quantity of heat, because we're going to be using insulation and the like, uh, the quantity of heat is going to be the same. It's just a matter of whether it's going to be absorbed or released by the calorimeter, or absorbed or released by the reaction. Um, we need, as it says here, the basic calorimetric, calorimetric measurement equation. We need to know how much heat is absorbed by the reaction. Uh, we got to know what the, what's going on with the actual um, calorimeter itself. So there are two main types. One is called a coffee cup calorimeter, very boring sounding. And the other one is called a bomb calorimeter. And that one sounds a little more exciting, but is a lot more complicated. So this is a typical view of a coffee cup calorimeter. Whereas you'll take, uh, they usually nest two, but one's usually sufficient, nest two uh, polystyrene cups, as, as those are styrofoam cups, into a device. 
and you'll put some water in there or whatever chemical you need to have that might be part of the reaction. And normally it's an aqueous solution, maybe it's an acid, maybe it's uh, a base, uh, maybe it's just water. And then you're going to put some sample in the bottom that is going to react. And when that sample reacts with the water, it's going to either release heat or absorb heat. Now, I mentioned in yesterday's video that the lab that we were going to do for this particular um, activity or for this particular chapter was one where we were going to take some sodium hydroxide and put it into a, a coffee cup of water. Well, what would happen is as we put the sodium hydroxide into the coffee cup and it were to dissolve, the water's temperature would increase. And because the water's temperature would increase, that would mean that the water would be absorbing heat and the energy that was absorbed by the water would be the energy, the exact same energy that was being released by the sodium hydroxide. So we do a little bit of math on the water and find out what the heat is and then be able to determine how much heat was lost by the reaction. So why do we use um, styrofoam? Well, it's a really great insulator. Same reason you make coffee cups out of it so you don't burn yourself. And so all the energy that is going to be released by the reaction essentially is absorbed by the water. Now, if you guys come to AP um, next year, one of the labs that we do um, is very, very similar to this. But we do also go back and try to incorporate how much heat is actually gained by the styrofoam because the styrofoam will change temperature a little bit. It's not a perfect insulator. So we spend a little bit of time trying to figure out what that is. So... In order to figure out what the Q of the reaction, whatever we're going to figure out what the Q of the reaction is, we're going to use that calorimetry equation that we talked about yesterday of MC delta T, where we're looking at the M of the water, the C of the water, and then the delta T of the water. Find out what that amount of energy is, but then take the opposite, meaning the positive or negative. So if the water were to increase in temperature, delta T would be positive. C is 4.184. Mass, you figure whatever the mass is, it must be in grams. Do that math, you're going to get a positive value, which means the water has increased in energy. That exact same amount of energy, but negative, is going to be released by the reaction. So let's look at this example. So they talk about calcium chloride. Calcium chloride is used, used is called ice melt. It's also used, as they say here, it's canning vegetables and um, uh, for firmness. They, um, we use it a lot during the winter season. It's called ice melt, where you sprinkle it on your driveway and it will, does, it will make the water get a little bit warmer and will generate a little bit of heat and will actually melt the ice or snow that is on your driveway. Um, if I were to take a calorimeter with 50 grams of water and it starts off at 25 degrees Celsius, and I were to put one gram of calcium chloride into that water and allow it to react, dissolve, completely do its thing. Um, once it's done, it's going to be up to 28.5 degrees Celsius. Now, look at that. You've got a three degree, three and a half degree increase in temperature. So the water is going to increase in temperature. The water is going to absorb energy. And that energy is going to come as a result of this chemical reaction right here of calcium chloride breaking up into its ions. Um, they say assume that the heat given off the reaction is transferred directly to the water. Essentially means you've got a perfect, perfect insulator. It says calculate the Q for the reaction system. What's the Q for the reaction where you have the number of grams of heat lost? So information is given to you. You have the mass. You have the amount of mass of the calcium chloride. You have the, look at that tiny little two there. I don't know why they did that. Really, really tiny two. Um, the temp initial temperature and the final temperature you should know, and again, I said yesterday, both in our video chat and in um, the video itself, you need to memorize the specific heat of water, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. That's a number you need to remember. And it actually asks you for the Q of the reaction. So I need to find out what delta T is, find out what the change in temperature is, put it into the equation, and then flip the, flip the switch, flip the um, sign of that number. So let's start with the top. Change in temperature. Final minus initial. Delta is always final minus initial. Delta is always final minus initial. Final temperature is 28.51. Initial temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. So a difference in temperature of a positive 3.51 degrees Celsius. Put that into the MC delta T. Again, uh, it's affectionately referred to as just MCAT. MC delta T because that delta looks a little like a, an A. 
MCAT, M, mass of the water, not of the calcium chloride, mass of the water. C of the water, 4.184, delta T of the water. One of the things about using MCAT or using CAT is both the C and the delta T or the M, the C, and the delta T all have to be of the exact same substance. Don't mix them up. Yes, you were given a mass of calcium chloride. It would make no sense to use the mass of calcium chloride, but then use the C of water. All three of the variables have to be of the same material. So you do this math. MC delta T, 50 times 4.184 times 3.51. You get that you had 300 and, sorry, I said that wrong, 734 joules of energy was absorbed by the water, which means the reaction released 7734 7 joules of energy. So it's negative, negative, implying that it is an exothermic reaction. The reaction released energy. The reaction lost energy. Okay, that's a coffee cup calorimeter. So, big picture. Since the water absorbed heat, since the final temperature was greater, the water absorbed heat. Therefore, since the water absorbed heat, the reaction had to release heat. So, the delta H, the Q of the reaction is going to be a negative value. Okay, the second type of reaction is a little more complicated in that it is not as good of an insulator. Okay, um, it is not as good of an insulator. It has this, it's, it's called a bomb calorimeter. Around the outside, the entire enclosure has a fantastic insulator to keep it free from the surroundings. But inside this bomb, there's a bunch of pieces that all can change in temperature pretty easily. So the big picture of a bomb calorimeter, and it's not, this is very cartoony looking, but it gets the point across, is inside of a big vessel, a, usually a, a metal canister, a sealed metal canister, they put a um, sample the, in a dish, and they also will usually put a bunch of oxygen into that canister to try to, to um, promote a reaction, a combustion reaction. And when they add the whole lot of oxygen to that, and they add the whole bunch of sample in there and close it up, they're going to take this big canister and put it into a big vat of water. So what you don't see here is this big gray box that has a big metal container on the inside of it is filled with water. So it's filled up with water. That's why they have this stir here. It's filled up with water. And then a couple wires are shot down in there so you can, once everything is under control, you can spark the sample and make a reaction take place. Well, suppose I take some sample and put it in there that is flammable, obviously, it's combustible, it's going to generate a whole lot of heat. Well, what's going to happen is this whole thing is going to get hot. The surroundings are going to get hot. But in this situation, different than coffee cup calorimeter, the surroundings consist of two parts. One, it's the water. And the second part is the calorimeter itself, the big metal can, the stirrer, the thermometer wire, the um, inside of this container, that's all also going to get hot also. So in the case of a bomb calorimeter, when trying to figure out where the heat went, it's going to go to two places. It's going to go to the water and it's going to go to the calorimeter. So your math is a little bit different. So why do we use a bomb calorimeter? Um, I could share with you guys some stories, but um, at, at 10 years ago, I had the opportunity, I guess it was less than 10 years, a little over 10 years ago, I had a chance to use a um, bomb calorimeter in a, a job that I had that was kind of cool. Um, they're very, very versatile. They, they can manage to, to test for amount of energy very, very quickly and very efficiently. Um, they, especially if the reaction is super, super hot because you can dis disperse that super hot reaction to a larger vessel of water. Coffee cup can only hold about 500 milliliters, not much water, but a bomb can calorimeter can hold literally gallons of water. So it can have a lot of energy can be absorbed into that. Um, it's called a bomb because it does have that explosion of the big combustion reaction going in it. And it is a closed system. The very, very outside, I'm going to go back. The very, very outside is insulated very, very well. But since all the parts inside are metal, they are going to also absorb some energy. So you have to worry about the, um, the energy loss and the energy gained of the entire system. So here's where the difference is. In the last situation, we had Q of the reaction, which is just the Q of the calorimeter or the Q of the water opposite. No, just one step. Well, here we have two parts. We have a calorimeter part and we have the water. 
both are going to absorb water, absorb energy. The water is going to increase in temperature as well as the calorimeter. And also, more interestingly, both are going to increase in temperature the same amount. Because when you start and you have the bomb filled with water, both the bomb and the water are going to have the same starting temperature. And as it gets warmed up, both the bomb and the water are both going to increase to the same final temperature. So delta T for both are going to be the same. Again, for the calorimeter, you're going to have cat C delta T. But for the water, you're going to have M cat M C delta T because you're going to, they're going to tell you how much water there is. So they have to give you this C that is of the calorimeter, knowing what the, the um, heat capacity is of the calorimeter. They will give you that directly. They'll say the heat capacity is blah, blah, blah. So let's look at an example. So if I take hydrogen chloride, hydrogen chloride is um, a gas. And it can be made by taking hydrogen gas and chlorine gas and mixing it together. So if I take, and this bomb is a little different, but instead of doing a true combustion reaction, they're going to put two different gases into the container and initiate it. They take exactly one gram of hydrogen gas and put it into that bomb. And they're going to take and fill it with an excess of chlorine um, so that we know we're going to be controlled only by the amount of hydrogen in there. And then once it's all sealed together, it's going to be put into a bomb calorimeter that has a heat capacity of 5.15 kilojoules per degree Celsius, a straight conversion of numbers degrees Celsius. For every one degree Celsius temperature change, you know you've put 5.15 kilojoules of energy in. And the bomb goes from 20 degrees up to 29.82 degrees. But they also tell you the bomb also contains, in addition to the actual contraption, it has one kilogram kilogram of water it's asked again similar to the last one what is the heat evolved by the reaction so since we see that the reaction went from 20 degrees up to 29.82 degrees we know that the bomb is going to be absorbing energy which means the reaction is going to be releasing energy so hopefully we get a negative q for this reaction so what do we have we have the mass of the hydrogen one gram we also have the mass of the water we have the C, big C, of the calorimeter when we know the final and the initial temperatures. Again, you should know what the specific heat of water is, 4.184, and it's asking for the Q of the reaction. So how are we going to do this? Well, first we're going to figure out what the Q for the water is, and then we're going to figure out what the Q of the calorimeter is by putting in, into the appropriate equation either MCAT or CAT. And then in order to figure out the reactions, the overall reactions heat loss is, we're going to combine those two together, those heats we just got, and then take the opposite sign. So the Q for the water, well, we're going to use MCAT, MC delta T, C for water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, mass of the water is 1,000 grams, and change in temperature of the water is the 9.82 degrees Celsius. For a whopping 41 kilojoules of energy or 41,000 joules of energy absorbed by the water. Then we're going to worry about the calorimeter. The calorimeter, cat calorimeter, is going to be the C, the 5.184, sorry, 5.15 kilojoules per degree Celsius times the 9.82 degrees Celsius change. And we find that the calorimeter absorbed 50 0.6 kilojoules of energy. So the water absorbed 41 and the calorimeter absorbed just a little less than 51. So how much energy was lost? So the reaction is going to lose energy equivalent to the amount that it absorbed by the calorimeter and how much is absorbed by the water or a total of 41, point, 41 plus 50.6 or 91.6 kilojoules of energy was lost by the calorimeter. Okay, so the difference between a bomb and a coffee cup is a coffee cup, you do not worry about the calorimeter because the calorimeter itself is designed to have essentially zero um, change in temperature. Whereas in a bomb, since you have all those metal pieces, they're gonna definitely increase in temperature. So you have to worry about incorporating that. And they mentioned the amount of hydrogen gas that reacted is not relevant in the solution of this problem because they didn't ask you. Now they could ask you, instead of saying the what's the heat of the reaction, they could say what's the heat of the reaction per mole of hydrogen gas, or what's the heat of the reaction per gram of hydrogen gas. Then you would incorporate the grams of the um, hydrogen into that reaction. And the last piece of the puzzle here um, that kind of falls under the auspices of 
the calorimetry is talking about this concept of latent heat. Now, it's not a calorimetry concept, but it's more talking about what happens to substances as they um, change. Well, everything we've done so far is dealt with water that is in its liquid state for the entire time. Um, starts at a low temperature, so ends up at a high temperature. So you're just seeing the temperature change, change temp the water change temperature. But what if the water starts off at a different phase? Well, I don't know whether you guys remember from Chem 1, but we talked about in Chem 1, we dealt with what are called the heating curves, where you're dealing with what happens to the temperature of a material as it undergoes phase changes versus as, it under, as there's one just phase there. So this represents the heating curve of any typical material where it's going to start off as just having a solid, say this blue area down here is while it's ice. And the ice is going to go from a temperature below for melting up to melting. But as soon as it reaches the melting temperature of ice, which is zero degrees Celsius, it is going to maintain its temperature until it actually stops melting. Well, let's think about that. What equation would we use there? We could not use MC delta T because delta T would be zero. Um, so since delta T would be zero, since the temperature is not changing, that makes no sense to use that because we know we have to put energy into ice in order to change it from a solid to a liquid. Um, same thing applies in the boiling stage. So during the various sections where the phase changes are taking place, you're going to either use what's called the heat of fusion or the heat of vaporization. The heat of fusion or heat of vaporization. Um, still, still, still the same concept. You're still going to be absorbing or releasing heat, but um, that heat is going to be directly proportional to how much material is changing phase. So if I look at this heating curve a little differently, and again, I've grabbed a, a different image off of Google here, is during any section that you're going to be changing temperature, you're going to use MC delta T. During any section where the temperature is changing, you're going to use MC delta T. But while the reaction is undergoing a non-temperature change, so it's either down here melting or up here um, boiling, you're going to use the heat of fusion. Now, sometimes the heat of fusion is going to be have the use of joules or kilojoules per mole, and sometimes it's going to have in joules or kilojoules per gram. So you're going to take what, some quantity some quantity of the material, either the moles or the mass, and multiply times the heat of fusion based on the units of the heat of fusion. Let's look at an example. So I want to know how much heat is absorbed by 180 grams of ice that starts off as negative 10 degrees Celsius in order to melt it and then increase its temperature to 50 degrees. And they give you the specific heat of ice because specific heat of ice is different than water. And they give the heat of the fusion, heat of fusion of water. So um, that's the, the how much energy it takes per mole to melt that um, water. Well, let's look at the re reaction. I did a really bad job of overwriting here, but you're starting here, down here in this section where you have the, the ice has a temperature of, say, 10 degrees, about halfway between zero and negative 20. And then it's going to increase, as you add energy, it's going to increase in temperature, and then it's going to melt. And then once it's done melting, it's going to increase in temperature again. So what you have here are three separate areas to do calculations. Q1 is an MCAT of the ice. Q2 is a heat of fusion of the melting process. And then Q3 is going to be the MCAT for the liquid. So when you break it down, you've got three sections from negative 10 to zero for the melting process, and then from zero up to 50. For negative 10 to zero, since the temperature is changing, you're going to use MCAT. Q1 is MC delta T. Plug the numbers in, 80 grams times the C for ice that was given to you, 2.07, sorry, 2.09 joules per gram degree Celsius, times the temperature change of, an, of a positive 10 degrees Celsius. So I find that in order to make ice go from negative 10 up to zero, it takes 3,770 joules of energy. Then I worry about what happens during the melting of ice. That's Q2. Again, you're going to have N delta F. Since the delta F um, heat of fusion was given to you in uh, the units of um, per mole, I need to take the number of moles times the heat of fusion. So I need to change my grams into moles by dividing it by the molar mass of water times the heat of fusion of, of the water. 
And then since this previous one was in joules, I want this one also to be in joules. So I did 1,000 joules per kilojoule to find to have 60,000 joules of energy is necessary to melt that ice. And then finally, since I'm going from 0 to 50 for the third section, I'm going to again, third time around, going to use MCAT. But this time, I'm worried about the change in temperature of my water going from 0 to 50. So I have my grams of water, my C for water, and my change in temperature of the water. I find out that I have 37, um, 37,700 joules of energy is required to change the temperature from 0 to 50. So how much energy is going to be released? Well, um, is it going to be needed to change that phase? Well, I have to add them together. So I have 3,700, 60,000, and 37, almost 38,000 for a th total of 101,600 joules of energy is needed to actually change that water. Okay, so what's next? Um, we're going to do a lot more um, calculations tomorrow. Um, will be the last day this week where we'll do some more example calculations using the calorimetry concept. Um, this can be quite complicated, and we're going to try to focus a lot more on interpreting what the problems are, um, what, que what uh, equation you need to use. Do you use CAT? Do you use MCAT? Um, how do you pull all that information out? Well, that's what we're going to focus on tomorrow. So hopefully you guys are staying safe, staying healthy, practicing your social distancing, not going out there in the real world too much. Um, I look forward to sometimes seeing you in the hopefully very near future. But until then, always remember, never forget, sig figs really do matter. Um, they really don't, but I can't like to say that anyway because Chimney wants to sell merchandise. Anyway, you guys have a great day. I will talk to you tomorrow via video chat um, from 2 o'clock until 3. Um, we'll see as many of you as possible there. Have a great day. Toodles.